Hi, welcome to Art Blanche, an art history podcast where we learn about the stories of artists, their work, and the impact they have on our modern understanding of art. Even if you're not familiar with this world, if you're interested in fascinating lives, dramatic stories, or cultural movements, you're in the right place. My name is Nancy, and I'm glad you're here. In this episode, we are covering Johannes Vermeer, a man whose career has been shrouded in a cloud of mystery. Not because he's especially secretive, but because he and his work only became widely well-known in the 1900s. That's over 200 years after his death. The lack of information about his life, combined with the mastery displayed in his work, gave way to criticism and controversy. But we'll get more into this later. Let's start at the very beginning. Johannes Vermeer was born in 1632 in Delft, Netherlands, where he spent the majority of his artistic career. He is now considered one of the greatest painters of the Dutch Golden Era. Despite having a very limited oeuvre of only 34 to 36 known paintings, different sources I've read cite different numbers here, some of his paintings have become the most beloved images in art history. Even if you don't know his name, you've probably at least heard of The Milkmaid or girl with a pearl earring. Because he lived a rather isolated life, and he didn't rise to fame until centuries after his death, there's not a lot that we know about Vermeer, but we can broadly paint a picture of what his life was like based on official records found in his home city of Delft. At this time, Delft was a very prosperous city, with the brewing, textiles, and pottery industries providing a lot of employment in the city. The economic prosperity was felt across all socioeconomic levels. Something that was unique about the Netherlands at this time was that the gap between the rich and the poor was much smaller compared to other countries, allowing for the middle class to afford a lot of luxuries that are typically reserved for the upper class. Luxuries such as art. As a side note, Delft is still well known for an earthenware pottery style that was inspired by Chinese porcelain. Early imports of porcelain from China were highly admired but extremely expensive, so the Dutch potters found a way to produce a cheaper alternative. The ceramics are made with a white tin glaze that is decorated with a cobalt oxide that gives it the characteristic blue color. While I was researching Delft, I definitely didn't expect to see this style of pottery pop up. It was interesting to see depictions of Western imagery in a style that we generally associate with the East. These blue and white ceramics can be found in various Vermeer paintings. Anyway, the city itself was absolutely picturesque. Canals ran in and out of Delft with the Neue Kirk steeple standing right in the heart of it all. The steeple was adjacent to a beautiful town hall and a market square. All of this was housed within walls that had protected the city during the Spanish occupation during the Eighty Years' War. Unsurprisingly, this beautiful city was an important influence in Vermeer's work. He painted the streets as subjects and humble home interiors as backgrounds. Sometimes he would allude to the city through maps on the walls in his paintings. In Vermeer's painting titled View of Delft, he depicted a view of the city from the southern side, showcasing the harbor that meanders through the protective walls. Beyond the walls in the distance is the illuminated tower of Neue Kirk. The buildings and boats are depicted with thicker layers of paint while the clouds and subtle reflections of the water seem to just exist effortlessly. The figures in the foreground are understated as if they're one with the environment. All of this creates a sense of light and tranquility in the scene. This quality of quietness and luminosity is something you'll notice as a theme running throughout all of his work. Along the same vein is his painting titled The Little Street, which depicts an angularly composed street view against the sky. Similar to the last painting, the buildings have a thicker, more detailed paint that emphasizes the softness of the sky. We also see some figures going about their day, placed in poses that seem ordinary, like they're simply doing chores in and around the house. The buildings feel old, as we can see some cracked facades and stains along the wood, but this only adds to the feeling of the scene's quiet humbleness. It's an ode to the details of the city that may have otherwise gone unnoticed. 
These are the only two known paintings by Vermeer that depict the outside streets, and they seem to hint at his appreciation and pride for Delft as the city that he would reside in for the majority of his life. To avoid confusion as we move into talking about his family, I'll be referring to Vermeer as Johannes. Johannes' father, Rainier Jans, was also born in Delft. More specifically, he was born in Basenmark, the market square where cattles were sold once a week. He lived in a house named Nasa until his father's death, which led to his mother remarrying and relocating the family to another house, also in Basenmark. And that house was named De Dore Hammers, which means the three hammers. Something to note is that all the houses that we talk about in this story have names. Buildings were named back then to make it easy to find a house or its residence. I think it speaks to how small and possibly intimate the city was. Rainier's mother, Johannes' grandmother, was a second-hand goods dealer working with the estates of deceased people. Handling paintings was a frequent part of her work, and it's speculated that this is what likely influenced Rainier and later down the line Johannes to become art dealers. Rainier lived in Basenmark until 1611 when he moved to Amsterdam at the age of 20 for an apprenticeship to learn silk linen weaving. He learned to produce a fine satin fabric called kaffa. There, he also married Digna Baltins in 1615. They both returned back to Delft where they gave birth to their daughter and Johannes' only sibling, Gertrude, in 1620. In addition to working as a weaver, Rainier was also an art dealer. He became a member of the Guild of St. Luke, which was a trade organization for artists and artisans that regulated the production and distribution of everything from tapestry weavers to booksellers to painters. Every city in the Netherlands had a self-governing guild that was responsible for overlooking local production. The artists and artisans all had a common desire to limit the import of art from outside of the city in the hopes that this would decrease external competition and allow the local art scene to flourish. One of the ways that this was achieved was by only allowing members of the Guild of St. Luke to sell and auction work. In exchange for this protection, artists members of the Guild were required to pay an entrance fee. It was through this organization that Rainier was allowed to buy and sell paintings in Delft with the title of Master Art Dealer. Finally, in 1632, Johannes, the man of the hour, was born on October 31st. At this point, the name Vermeer was still not yet attached to the family. It wasn't common for last names to be used in this time. For example, it was easy enough to refer to Johannes as the son of Rainier, and everyone in the city would understand exactly which family he came from. It wasn't until 1640 when Rainier was first officially documented using the name Vermeer as his last name, but it's unclear why he chose to use it at all. Around this time, the family became prosperous enough to move away from Bistenmark and purchase a large inn named Mechelen, which primarily drew in middle-class people as customers. The inn was located in an ideal part of town, Grotenmark, or the Market Square. It was along the Wolderkrost Canal, where artists and collectors would naturally meet. For some context, this area was considered more respectable than Basenmark, which primarily housed working class folks. Grotemark, on the other hand, was the commercial center of Delft. Remember the Neue Kirk steeple from Vermeer's painting earlier? This market square was right next to it, in the heart of it all. During this century in the Netherlands, inns were more than just a place for lodging and eating. They were where business transactions and gatherings took place, a hub for socializing, economic transactions, and cultural exchanges. These inns would vary in terms of their respectability. Some would host art auctions and musical performances, while others may just be brothels. Regardless of what purpose they played in the community, it's no doubt that these inns played a large role in the Dutch Golden Age, which spanned from 1588 to 1672. With all that in mind, let's go back to Rainier's Inn, Mechelen. The accessibility of the location and the class of customers made the inn an ideal place for Rainier to continue his business as an art dealer. Although the people in this area were not of the upper class, 
As we mentioned earlier, the prosperity of the Netherlands during this time meant that the purchasing of luxury goods, like artwork, was more widely accessible. The art dealing that Rainier did at this new inn may sound very hoity-toity, but what it essentially amounts to is him purchasing paintings to display on the walls of the inn with the hopes that someone one day will walk in, see it, and buy it for a higher price. It was at this inn that Johannes was born in 1632. Unfortunately, the joint business venture of being an art dealer and an innkeeper didn't pan out very well for Rainier. The interest he was paying on the inn was very high, and many of his customers were delinquent in settling their tabs with the inn. By 1651, the customers of Mechlin owed Rainier more than the cost of his yearly interest on the inn's mortgage. Rainier died in 1652, 11 years after purchasing Mechelen, leaving his family with the inn, the art dealing business, and a lot of debt. From this point on, I'll refer to Johannes as Vermeer again. There aren't many records of Vermeer in his early life until April 1653, when Vermeer, now at the age of 21, married Katharina Bolnese, the youngest daughter of a wealthy Catholic family. Although Vermeer's parents were married within the Reformed faith, and Vermeer was baptized in the Reformed church, and the official state religion was Protestantism, he converted to Catholicism after his marriage with Katharina. Some people speculate that because marriages between Catholics and non-Catholics were not accepted by the Catholic Church, Vermeer was pressured to convert to Catholicism to allow for the marriage to be recognized, and perhaps also to appease his very religious mother-in-law, Maria Tins. It's unclear how Vermeer himself felt about the conversion and whether or not he fully embraced Catholicism as a religion. The allegory of faith, created between 1670 and 1674, is one of Vermeer's later paintings that might give us a hint to his thoughts on the Catholic Church. In the painting, we see a female figure within a space filled with religious symbols. On the floor in the foreground, there is a snake that's getting crushed by a rectangular rock that's meant to represent Christ. Next to it is a bitten apple representing mankind's original sin. Behind the figure, in the dark, shadowy background, is a painting of Christ crucified on the cross, the moment he saved mankind. Looking at the woman, we can see her foot is stepping on a globe, her right hand is clutching her chest, and her left arm is resting on an altar table where a missile lays open. For those, like me, who are not well versed in Catholic practices, a missal is a type of book that contains prayers, chants, and instructions for the celebration of Mass. If the woman represents Catholicism, then her foot on the globe is a symbol of the dominance of the Catholic Church all over the world. Because the official state religion was Protestantism, it may seem odd that all these symbols of Catholicism are depicted inside of a Dutch home. But this is how Catholics, including his mother-in-law, worshipped at the time. The state government didn't allow for them to worship publicly, so many of them would do so privately in the chapels of their own homes. However, despite all of these symbols and signals of what he may have thought about Catholicism in this painting, something to keep in mind is that this painting may have been a commission and might not actually reflect Vermeer's own beliefs. We can't know for sure, but we can make guesses based on how he appeared to lead his life through leftover documents. And as such, we have our first unsolvable Vermeer mystery. On December 29th, 1653, Vermeer registered as a master painter of the Guild of St. Luke in Delft, but he was only able to pay one-sixth of the total fee to join. Other well-known artists appeared in the same document, such as Pierre de Hooch and Carel Fabricius. As per the guild's requirements, Vermeer likely underwent a four- to six-year apprenticeship. Once an apprentice gains mastery through the training, the guild allows them to conceptualize and create their own paintings, but they're not yet allowed to sign or sell the paintings. 
It is only after passing the guild's entrance exam when the artist would be able to officially sign their own work and, if needed, sell other artists' paintings to supplement their earnings. Although there is not much known about his training, it has been speculated that Vermeer may have traveled to Italy, France, or Flanders in the late 1640s and early 1650s like other artists in the city. Alternatively, he may have trained in Dutch artistic centers like Utrecht or Amsterdam, where he would have been influenced by Caravaggio and Rembrandt traditions. Given how expensive these trainings would have been, it's also very likely that they were facilitated by his mother-in-law's connections and money. Early in his artistic career, Vermeer was interested in religious scenes and mythological themes, both of which were considered more impressive than landscapes, portraits, and still life at the time. These paintings were thought to require more knowledge rather than merely imitating scenes from real life. One of his first known paintings was Christ in the House of Martha and Mary, created between 1654 and 1656. He was about 22 years old at the time. According to the National Galleries of Scotland, it is the largest and earliest surviving painting by Vermeer, and the only known work of a biblical subject. This painting shows a glimpse of the style he adopted early on in his career, a style that is reminiscent of a Caravaggio painting. The painting depicts a scene from the Book of St. Luke of the New Testament in which two sisters, Martha and Mary, are welcoming Jesus into their homes in the midst of his travels. In this scene, we see Martha, Mary, and Jesus in a triangular composition, which is known to be a very strong foundational way of architecturing a painting. Jesus is sitting in a chair on the right side of the frame, with Martha sitting just below him to his left, listening intensely. Meanwhile, Martha is standing sort of behind them a bit, leaning down and holding a basket of bread. Jesus' gaze is on Martha, and it is said that this is the moment he is imploring her to place the spiritual above the material by contemplating with them instead of focusing on serving. Jesus is also pointing at Mary as if he's using her as an example of someone who is following a more righteous path. The brushstrokes in this painting are much broader and gestural than the paintings we know Vermeer for. However, even in this early painting, we can see elements that he continues to maintain as his artistic career progresses. The way the light falls in from the left side of the painting and illuminates the figures, the subtle interplay of light and shadow to create textures, the focus on spatial composition in interior scenes, and the overall sense of tranquility. In 1656, Vermeer paid the remaining balance on his master's fee to the Guilds of St. Luke as a painter. That same year, he painted and signed the Procurus, his first genre painting. Genre art depicts scenes of daily life, including ordinary people doing ordinary things in ordinary settings. In some sense, it would be considered the complete opposite of history paintings, which was what he was working on prior. By the second half of the 1650s, Vermeer's entrance into genre painting was in full swing. The paintings he created in this phase of his career are the ones he will eventually become most well-known for. In addition to showing ordinary life, genre paintings also typically contain themes related to duty, family, societal values, and love. As we've mentioned earlier, this was a time when a lot of middle-class folks were able to afford paintings and these smaller, secular paintings were popular to hang in homes, taverns, and shops. The Dutch Calvinists, who fostered a culture of austerity and moderation, didn't approve of devotional artwork and instead focused on the world around them, placing emphasis on hard work as a virtue. All of this likely influenced Vermeer's shifts away from history paintings. Even if there is more worldwide glory in history paintings, there's just not as much money in it. After his father's death, Vermeer and Katharina assumed Rainier's debts, but Vermeer's mother continued to manage the inn. It's likely that Maria, his mother-in-law, helped alleviate the financial burdens that this couple experienced. Over time, Vermeer seemed to have distanced himself from his family and became more and more integrated into Katharina's. Between the help he received during his apprenticeship to receiving loans during his financial woes from Maria, it seems likelier and likelier that the conversion to Catholicism was greatly influenced by his new family. 
In the late 1650s, Vermeer and Katharina moved into Maria's house, where he spent the remainder of his life, creating nearly all of his paintings in the same room in that house. Within the household was his wife, his mother-in-law, and his 11 children, though there were likely even more people living in the house. All of this would point at the house being bustling and chaotic, but surprisingly, this isn't reflected in his paintings at all. They do not suggest any bit of familial togetherness or craziness, just quiet moments. His painting, Girl Reading a Letter at an Open Window, created in 1659, is the first of many paintings in which he showcases women in quiet, intimate, domestic settings. The girl is standing in front of an open window, her full profile angled toward the viewer, where she is peacefully reading a letter. In the window, you can see the slightest reflection of her face and dapplings of light reflecting the sun coming through the window and drenching the room. There are also some smaller details within the painting that aren't immediately noticed. A dark chair embellished with lions is pushed up against the back corner. A table covered with an ornate rug bunches up underneath a bowl full of fruit in the foreground. And a red curtain drapes from the top left of the ceiling and frames the open window. More prominently is a large green curtain on the right of the composition. It hangs from a wooden rod that spans the entire top of the painting. It seems to sit on an entirely different plane from the room, as if it exists on our side, the viewer's side, of the painting, pulled aside just to reveal the scene to us. It creates a dimensionality that feels almost like a curtain in a theater, a barrier that separates the hushed room from the public eye of the viewer. This trompe l'oeil, which means deceives the eye in French, is a motif that recurs in numerous paintings by Vermeer. There is a suggestion of voyeurism with the viewer peering into an unassuming private moment. I also wanted to take some time to highlight some of the most notable things about Vermeer's work as exhibited in this painting. Windows are almost always to the left in his compositions, which is an artistic convention that goes back to the ancient Romans. Additionally, the windows always have a lot of textures and imperfections to juxtapose with the softer, filtered light. For example, he will sometimes include a cracked window pane to allow unfiltered light to enter into the room, further illuminating the cracks in the walls, darker details, and sometimes illusions to be revealed. The light dances around the canvas to activate certain objects or body parts while keeping others in subtle shadow. The height of his productivity began in the late 1650s and would extend for a little over a decade. Through the use of the window, he would create scenes that were incomparable to other Dutch artists at the time, bringing a timelessness and dignity to his subjects, who were typically women doing mundane, everyday things like putting on jewelry, pouring milk, writing letters, and more. He revealed a harmony within daily life. The objects in the compositions were very meticulously chosen and intentionally placed, with the primary aim of creating a sense of order. Every color, every object, every highlight and shadow created a sense of balance in a well-defined architectural space. And within all of this, he continued to imbue symbolic meaning into many of his paintings. Despite no longer being a history painter, he continued to place details that implied moral and philosophical ideas, such as in his painting called Women Holding a Balance, where the painting of the Last Judgment is hanging in the background behind a woman who, as the title suggests, is holding a balance. In 1662, Vermeer was appointed one of the headmen of the Guild of St. Luke, which is considered a position of high esteem for an artist at the time. He was appointed once again in 1670. While he was a headman at the Guild, he created his most well-known painting of all time, and it's likely the painting you've been waiting for us to talk about. Girl with a Pearl Earring. <laughs> Created in 1665, this painting has been called the Mona Lisa of the North as a means of illustrating the extent to which this has captivated generations of art lovers. This painting has been adapted in many ways, from t-shirts to coasters, selfies to, most notably, a historical fiction novel. There aren't any records to indicate who this painting was created for, and it was lost for about 200 years until a collector found it and bought it for the equivalent of less than $1 today. 
Once cleaned, it was discovered to be painted by Vermeer, then donated to the Moritz House in The Hague, where it has remained ever since. So, why is this painting so special? Tracy Chevalier, the author of the aforementioned historical fiction book called Girl with a Pearl Earring, which was later adapted into a movie starring Scarlett Johansson and Colin Firth, said this about why she believed this painting to be so seductive. Quote, the striking blue and yellow of the girl's headscarf set against a black background. The glistening pearl created in a few swift strokes. The expert capturing of light and shade on her luminous skin. The liquid pools of her eyes all add up to a work of sublime beauty. There really is a brilliant quality to this painting. A word that I've used a number of times now and can't help but bring up again is luminous. The way the light wraps around the fabric and creates a glisten in her eyes and lips is undeniable. She also looks unassuming, like a blank canvas onto which we can project someone, anyone we know on top of. We can't see her eye color and we can't see her hair at all. When we look even closer at her face, the particularities of her features become fuzzy and even less defined. A nose that blends into her cheek, Eyebrows and eyelashes that soften into the barest of existence. A facial structure that doesn't have prominence in any way. And an expression that refuses to give us a glimpse into what she is thinking or feeling. We know her, but we also know nothing. She's familiar, yet completely elusive. She's beautiful, and more importantly, universal. From here, there are two more things I think are important in discussing Vermeer his use of the color blue, and the dots of paint he uses for highlights. The blue Vermeer uses is made from ultramarine, a pigment made from lapis lazuli, imported from modern-day Afghanistan. It was extremely rare and expensive during this time, often said to be more valuable than gold. When used by other artists, blue is limited to very specific, small portions of the painting to highlight something of particular importance such as the Virgin Mary in many biblical paintings. Even though we don't know Vermeer to be an outrageously successful and wealthy artist while he was alive, he was a provincial artist after all. He makes heavy use of it in many of his paintings, even lavishly placing them in the shadows or below umber and ochre to subtly tint the shade. We can see this in the clothing folds of the girl with the pearl earring. Through documents and Delft, we can see events like Vermeer inheriting money from various people, notably his mother-in-law and some patrons, and loaning money from people who would eventually purchase multiple paintings from him throughout his career. But nothing ever explained how he would have managed to get his hands on this amount of ultramarine. How he was able to afford any of this continues to be a mystery. Turning our attention to the girl's pearl, we see a brilliant swipe of white that accents the highlight of the earring, a highlight that can be seen even when we're standing far away from the painting. This isn't an unusual detail in Vermeer's work. He would often use pointillism in various objects like bread in a basket or a reflective chandelier to create impressionistic dots of colors as if the light is flickering on the surface. The optical effect creates shifts in the eye's focus, almost like a camera obscura. Which brings us to our final mystery and perhaps the largest continuing controversy about Vermeer. Some background information. A camera obscura is a 17th century box camera that essentially consists of a small opening known as a pinhole. Light rays from an external scene would enter into this hole and strike a surface inside the box where the scene would be reproduced. The images had a very limited depth of field, meaning it would have a lot of unfocused areas and hazy highlights just as a camera would function in modern day if you had the aperture wide open. Many modern day observers have accused Vermeer of using a camera obscura to create his paintings, arguing even so far as claiming he traced the projected images. I personally think that this controversy is very overblown. Maybe it was a way to stir up drama and gain the right to call a masterful painter a cheat. But regardless, let's go through each of the arguments point by point and discuss their validity. The first argument is that his paintings are very photorealistic and the perspective is accurate. The attention to detail this requires seems suspect given the lack of evidence of his formal training and no existing preparatory sketches. 
I think this point ignores the fact that he was an official member of the Guild of St. Luke as a master painter, where it is required to go through an intense period of apprenticeship. His lack of widespread success in the years he lived means that there wouldn't necessarily be extensive documentation and archiving of his life and work. This isn't the modern day where we all have camera phones and Instagram pages to post our works in progress or photos of ourselves working. Additionally, there have been x-rays of his paintings that have shown sketchy underpaintings and objects that have been covered up in subsequent layers. Is it that impossible to believe that someone would be able to accurately depict a scene that's in front of them directly onto a canvas, as many artists are trained to do? The second argument is that the tiny dots that he paints for his highlights look like chromatic aberrations in the highlights, deliberately leaving out details to suggest the reflection of light. This is a highly unusual painting technique for the time. Impressionism wasn't a thing yet. The pearly highlights in Vermeer's paintings look exactly like it would be the result of a camera obscura halation. This point stands a bit firmer in my mind, but if he is observing the scenes in a projected image and studying the way the light scatters in the highlights, is it unacceptable to bring these observations into his paintings? What is considered a respectable way to bring a new technique into the painting medium? Is it fair to go so far as calling him a cheat? Some scholars have said that the use of the camera obscura have been exaggerated, instead pointing at the small pinpricks that have been found in his paintings. There is a rudimentary technique for composing paintings that consists of attaching a string to a pin on one end and chalk on the other end, and then drawing perspective lines and determining vanishing points with them. In the painting, Woman Holding a Balance, there is a pinprick right where her fingertips are holding the balance. Vermeer had determined that this would be the detail that marked the vanishing point in order to emphasize it amongst all the other elements of the painting. And beyond all of these arguments, even if he did take influences from the camera obscura halations for his sparkling highlights, even if, let's assume the worst, he did use a pencil to trace the images, did he not, at the end of the day, paint incredible masterpieces that depict light in a way that has completely enraptured the modern audience? Is the magic performance not captivating because it is an illusion? There is something that is still undoubtedly thought-provoking in the way he's decided to compose his scenes, capture light, and illustrate humans. In 1669, his mother died, quickly followed by his sister just three months later. With the family he grew up with all gone, he inherited the Mechelen Inn from his mother, this marks the beginning of a great downturn in Vermeer's life, as well as the country itself. Holland experienced what was called the Year of Disaster, following Louis XIV's invasion with French troops in 1672. The economy experienced an incredible downturn that collapsed the art market, damaging Vermeer's source of income as both a painter and an art dealer. There was evidence that Vermeer had many paintings by other artists in his house that he was never able to sell, further exasperating their financial losses. The art market had declined so sharply that even his art dealing was not enough to supplement the lack of sales of his own work. The Dutch Golden Age came to a close. Records show that he was listed as a member of the Civic Guards in 1674, and just a year after that, he quickly died of illness in 1675 at the age of 43, leaving behind a wife, 11 children, and unfathomable debts. This may sound familiar because it's similar to how his father's life ended as well. While Vermeer's notability as a painter was limited locally to the city of Delft, he lived a life in which he was respected as a provincial genre painter who created paintings that aligned with the values of the people he was surrounded by. After he died, he, for the most part, was forgotten. Many of his paintings were mistakenly attributed to other Dutch artists like Pieter de Hooch or even Rembrandt. But that's not the end of the story, as we know. All of this changed in 1866 when Etienne Joseph Théophile Thorey a French art critic passionately wrote about Vermeer's paintings, and just like that, the love for his work spread like wildfire across the public, 
Everyone from private collectors to public museums were enamored with Vermeer, and his work became widely sought after. Prices skyrocketed by the 1900s. Various exhibitions around the world added fuel to this fire, most prominently the 1995-6 display of Vermeer's work at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., where all eyes were on the girl with the pearl earring. At the end of it all, despite the mystery surrounding him, Vermeer injected a beautiful new way for all of us to witness the magic of light in the everyday world. I think Arthur K. Wheelock, a curator at the National Gallery of Art, summarizes it best. Quote, Vermeer found beneath the accidents of nature a realm infused with harmony and order, and in giving visual form to that realm, he revealed the poetry existing within transient moments of human existence. And perhaps more simply put, in the words of my father-in-law, Jack Reed, upon viewing Vermeer's work, he said, it's like there's a light bulb hidden within his paintings. That's all I had on the life, work, and influence of Johannes Vermeer. Thank you for joining me in this first episode of Art Blanche. Until next time. This episode was researched and written by me, Nancy. Theme music is by Jimmy Sudicum. Recording and engineering is by Henry Reid. All sources are cited in the show notes.